everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the theory colloquium of today. It will be given by Giovanni Villadoro and I want to personally thank him to accept our invitation. He already served the GGI in 2015 when he was a lecturer of one of our, of our schools and the students appreciated his lectures very much. So really thank Giovanni again. Before starting, I want to inform you that as promised, we have opened a Q&A session for each seminar on our website. If you have a question, you just fill the form. The organizers will answer or ask the speaker to answer to your question and then it will be published. That's all on my side. I have a nice tea break and I ask Roberto to introduce the speaker. Thanks again. Okay, thanks Stefania and uh, welcome to everybody. So it's a real pleasure to, to introduce uh, Giovanni Vinadoro as our speaker today. Giovanni made uh, his undergraduate studies in Rome uh, at the University La Sapienza where he got his PhD in uh, 2006. Then he went to uh, Harvard, uh, then CERN and then SLAC as a, as a postdoc fellow. And since 2013, he has been holding a permanent position as a research scientist at uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics in, uh, in Trieste. I would say that his research record is, uh, is quite uh, unique uh, as uh, since the beginning of his career, Giovanni has worked on, uh, on uh, different, uh, very different uh, uh, and diverse topics such as, for example, lattice gauge theory, supergravity and strings, flavor physics and cosmology uh, with a mix uh, of, uh, of uh, phenomenology and, and uh, more theoretical aspects that it's, uh, I think is, uh, is not so common. Since a few years, uh, he got interested in, uh, in, uh, in the physics of axions. And uh, I think where his broad expertise uh, uh, proved very useful. And um, I would say that what Giovanni uh, has been doing in, uh, in the field of action, uh, action physics is try to, try to uh, get, uh, uh, try to, to determine the properties of actions in, uh, uh, precisely, okay? With a, with a level of, of, of accuracy and precision, uh, making use of, of, uh, of kind of perturbation theory, lattice QCD and other theoretical tools. So one of the difficult quantities uh, to predict reliably, reliably is the relic uh, uh, abundance of, of axions in the case in which the Perchaic uh, queen symmetry is, is broken after inflation. And today he will uh, tell us about this, uh, this aspect. Um, so before leaving the stage to, to Giovanni, uh, I, let, me, let me remind you that uh, if you have urgent questions, you can ask them during the seminar. Uh, by using the chat, so you, you will be muted by default, so you can use the chat to write your question or raise a hand, and I, I will let you uh, speak. Uh, for all the other questions and, and a final discussion, there will be uh, a session at the end of the seminar, again, with the same, the same uh, way of uh, either writing questions in the chat, and then I will report them to, to Giovanni, or uh, you raise hand with, with Zoom. So please, Giovanni. Thank you, Roberto, for the nice introduction. Thank you also, uh, Stefani, all the organizers for inviting me. And uh, maybe thank also Andrea Ringwald that uh, made a very nice introduction last week, which allowed me basically to spend less time on the introductory part, a little bit more on the main subject of this uh, colloquium, which will be basically the dark matter aspect uh, of the QCD axiom. So I'll just uh, go through the initial uh, motivation. So as uh, we saw already last week, uh, one of the open problems of the standard model is uh, the smallness of uh, the so-called theta parameter, this uh, basically coefficient coupling in front of the topological charge in the standard model, which has been constrained by the absence of observational three dipole moment of the neutron to be very small below 10 to the minus 10, which basically make it one of the, or the smallest the dimensionless parameters of the standard model. The smallness of this parameter is basically what is called the strong CP problem. 
And uh, most probably the most elegant and robust solution to this problem is assuming that, that this parameter is actually determined by the expectation value of a dynamical field, the so-called axion. So you basically replace theta with the, a scalar field, the axion field over some scale, FA, which is the decay constant of the field, which regulates how the axion actually couples to QCD and to the standard model. This uh, scale is uh, basically linked to the UV parameter of the theory, which is the uh, Peche Queen scale V, which is determined basically the, uh, the, the scale of the associated spontaneously broken uh, U1 symmetry of the axion and uh, some parameter, integer parameter, which regulates the anomaly, which determine this, uh, this coupling here. So the nice feature of the axiom arises uh, thanks to the waffer witten theorem, the guarantee that the standard model itself, QCD itself, generate a potential for the axiom, which relaxes its value to the CP conserving value uh, to zero, thus solving the strong CP problem. The uh, basically uh, properties of these potentials can be uh, determined quite, quite accurately within the standard model within QCD, and for example, the value of the mass of the axion, the curvature of this potential is now, is now known at better than percent precision. So uh, thanks to uh, effective theories and uh, lattice QCD calculations. So in particular, the mass of the axion is related to this, this decay constant FA, uh, is inversely proportional to it, since basically uh, it regulates the coupling to the standard model, larger coupling means larger mass. So indeed, all the couplings of the standard model to uh, the axion are related, are, are controlled by the scale uh, FA. So which can be uh, then transcript to uh, the mass of the axion. So heavier axion means larger cap to the standard model, smaller axion mass, smaller cap to the standard model. So you can see last week uh, a seminar for more details about this aspect. Giovanni, some of the, the participants asked if you can speak a, a bit more loudly. Oh, uh, yes, I'll try. Um, so, uh, so what is the parameter space still open for the QCD action? Well, uh, the main constraint on the QCD action come from astrophysics, uh, but there are still many orders of parameters allowed for the mass of the axion and the associated decay constant. Indeed, basically all values of the mass of the axion, almost all values of the mass of the axion between uh, 10 to minus 11 electron volts and uh, 10 to minus two electron volts and 10 to minus one electron volts are still allowed. The endpoints of this uh, parameter range are constrained as I said by astrophysics. In particular, smaller mass range where the decay constant is close to Planck and is actually constrained by the so-called uh, uh, super radiance effect by the non observation of by the observation of uh, fastly rotating uh, black holes, astrophysical black holes. And uh, the other uh, end point, which is the region where the axion couple more strongly to the standard model, instead is uh, constrained by non observation of uh, uh, anomalous cooling of stars or uh, uh, supernova. Um, all the region in between is still allowed almost, except some uh, few lines. And uh, for basically almost all or probably all of these parameter spins, QCD action can explain the observed relic dark matter abundance of the universe today. And this is, both pro is basically what is most of my talk will be concentrated on, explaining how and why. Um, uh, by just considering uh, the axion as the responsible for dark matter, so matching uh, the abundance of axion with the observed uh, ab abundance of dark matter, and by the fact that the mass of the axion needs to be light in order to fit experiments, this implies that the, number, the occupation number of the axion, if it's dark matter, is very large. Indeed, uh, for most of this parameter space, the occupation number of the axion is larger than the Avogadro number which means that uh, for all practical purposes, the axion behaves as a classical field. And uh, in most of the parameter space is more classical than most of, your, of the objects in your room. 
uh, and uh, e exactly uh, exploiting this fact, uh, many experiments are trying to look for the axion. Uh, despite the smallness of the coupling, this basic announcement due to the large occupation number allows to probe uh, such a particle in, even in the regime where the coupling is uh, uber small. And uh, most of this uh, experience has been reviewed uh, last week by Ringwald, so I will not uh, go again through them. So, so now the, the, the rest of my talk will be basically focused on how axions are produced in the early universe and how they can account for dark matter. So the first mechanism that comes to mind is related to the fact that the axion have to couple to the standard model to explain uh, basically the strong CP problem. So the axion can couple to the standard model, which means that in the early universe, the uh, standard model thermal bus can in principle produce action. And for example, here there are just a couple of example of diagrams where the action coupled directly to the gluons to the, uh, in the thermal bath, which produce the action. So the cross section uh, for this production is basically again controlled by the, the capping one over FA. The cross section goes like one over FA squared. Uh, and uh, now depending if the rate of production, which is sigma n here, it's uh, fast enough compared to the Hubble expansion, the actual axion produced in this way can become in thermal equilibrium with the uh, thermal bus. And this happens if the temperature is large enough because after all the coupling of the axion is basically regulated by, by the temperature. So if the temperature is large enough compared to the scale FA, then uh, the axion has been in, in thermal uh, in thermal equilibrium with a, a standard model bus, which means that some relic action will be produced in this way. Uh, this uh, action will have a momentum which is related to the temperature. So given the smallness of the mass of the action, action produced in this way, they, be, they, they will still be relativistic during the BBN and uh, in most of the parameter space during uh, uh, basically matter radiation equality which means during the CMB formation. Uh, this means that they uh, basically give a contribution as a relativistic species to the energy density in the real universe and is therefore uh, constrained by uh, our constraints on the number of relativistic species and number of uh, neutrinos in the early universe. Their contribution will basically be given by uh, this ratio here, the ratio of the temperature of the axion and the, the neutrino, which basically boils down to the ratio of degrees of freedom which were uh, relevant during the decoupling of the axion from the thermal bus. A, a small temperature, basically the coupling dies, so the, eventually the axion will decouple from the thermal bus and they will just reshift uh, uh, as radiation. So this number is basically of order 2%, 2.6% and is at the boundary of what the CMB stage four experiments could actually probe. Uh, so so th this basically uh, number here reflects to this region in parameter space, which I borrowed by Francesco and collaborators uh, latest paper. Um, and here you see that indeed, if the temperature of the universe has been large enough compared to the scale of FA, in this case, there is a, a relic abundance of relativistic uh, uh, axion produced. If instead the temperature was not that high in this blue region, what happens is basically that you, 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 you cannot produce them. There is a, a possibility to produce more axion if the uh, coupling of the axion to the standard model is large enough, if the phase is small enough, because in that case, what happens is that uh, the action decouples later where the number of degrees of freedom in thermal equilibrium is smaller and this will enhance basically this, uh, this, uh, this contribution. Uh, unfortunately, for probably for most of the models, uh, this region of enhancement uh, is uh, uh, highly constrained by uh, astrophysics. Um, okay, so this is one uh, production mechanism. 
Uh, but maybe a more interesting one is the one that will lead to uh, a larger abundance of actually cold action, which can account for dark matter. So indeed, there is an extra, uh, a, a, another mechanism of production of uh, action in the early universe, which has nothing to do with the coupling of the action to the standard model. And it's basically guaranteed to be there in any case. Uh, this uh, mechanism is basically uh, what is called misalignment mechanism. And uh, the actual production of axions produced in this way depends on uh, the relative uh, importance of the pitch queen scale compared to the other scale in the early universe, in particular the uh, scale of inflation, HI, and the maximum temperature during, uh, during pre-eating or eating. If these temperatures or the, the scales, uh, ab ab or temperature, are small compared to the pitch queen scale, then uh, we are in the, what is called the pre-inflation scenario. In this case, basically, the thermal fluctuation of the thermal bath or the quantum fluctuation during inflation not large enough to restore the pitch queen uh, symmetric phase after inflation. So what happens after inflation is that uh, you find yourself in a broken phase and the pitch queen symmetry, symmetric phase is not restored, which means that the axion field will uh, find itself in some particular value across the whole observable universe. Uh, which, however, is not calculable, as I will discuss uh, later. In the other case, where the, basically we are in the regime of large pitch queen scale, uh, scales compared to either the inflationary scale, both the inflationary scale, sorry, maybe it should have been, uh, oh no, sorry, when VPQ is, is smaller than uh, at least one of, the, of them, so this, this is, is the so-called post-inflationary scenario. In this scenario, what happens is that either because of quantum fluctuation during inflation or because of uh, thermal fluctuation, after inflation, the pitch queen symmetric phase is restored, which means that uh, within the observable universe, all uh, values of the pitch queen phase of the axion phase will be probed. And this means that uh, basically, uh, the, the evolution will be governed by this different uh, initial condition. So basically the evolution of the axionic field after inflation de is determined by the ratio of these scales. And depending on which scenario you are, the evolution is different and the prediction for the abundance and the structure of dark matter will be different as we will see. So let's start with the pre-inflationary scenario. So what happens in this case? So let's assume our initial condition is some uh, random distribution of axionic field. This is not very important. What is the initial distribution? Let's just assume that uh, uh, all values are allowed before inflation. Then at a certain point, inflation will start. And uh, during inflation, what happens is that uh, uh, small regions of space are exponentially stretched at very large scales. And depending where you are, what happens is that the large patches of the universe will basically see a constant value of the action. Basically, the action field is completely stretched across uh, uh, above the horizon. So depending on where you are, the uh, observable universe will only see a small patch of the sky. And the value of the action field at the beginning that, that the, each patch of the observable universe will see depends on which part of the bigger universe you will consider. If you live here, you'll have this initial condition. If you live there, it will be another one. Different observable observer will see different initial values for theta. So in this regime, the initial value for the theta term, for the expectation value of the axion, is basically not calculable. It's an, an environmental uh, quantity. It will depend uh, where you are in the, in the universe. Uh, but nevertheless, this initial condition simplifies the calculation of the future evolution. Because then if you just look at one patch of observable universe, the action field will look constant after inflation. This means that the field have initial condition which is basically independent of the coordinate x. So only the zero mode will be excited. The equation of motion of the field now simplifies enormously because there is no gradient term. 
And uh, the equation of motion basically boils down to a simple second order differential equation, which can be easily integrated as an analytical numeric. There will be a friction term due to the, to the, to the universe expansion. And there will be some potential, which is basically the, uh, the potential of the axon determined by QCD. So at very early universe, what happens is when the temperature of the universe is very large, this potential is suppressed just because QCD effects at large temperature are screened. So the uh, contribution to the axion potential just come from non-perturbative effects, which at large temperature are power suppressed. Uh, this, uh, this temperature dependence has been studied uh, uh, in the old days with the uh, uh, Instanton gas approximation, and more recently with lattice simulation, it seems that the two approaches agree with the temperature dependence that scales with the height powers of the temperature. Uh, so, so at the very early universe, basically what we have, we have no potential basically, it just friction. So the action will stay constant. As the universe expands, Hubble, the friction decreases, the potential grows, and at a certain point, the potential will become more important than the friction. The action will start oscillating around the minimum, relaxing uh, towards values that are very close to zero. Now, so here is a, is, is a plot of time evolution. We have a Hubble that decreases, the mass, the potential, which increases. At the, at the beginning, the action is constant. When the two contributions start to be comparable, the action starts oscillating. It starts oscillating, the oscillations become smaller and smaller because you still have friction. This energy density stored in this oscillation behaves as cold dark matter. It behaves as cold dark matter just because all you have is a zero mode, you have no gradients, no momenta. So this uh, field configuration basically corresponds to a gas of uh, action at rest, non relativistic. And uh, of course, the abundance you get in this way will depend on the mass of the action because the mass, mass of the axis that determine when the, this oscillation start, so how much time they have to reshift until now. And of course, the initial value, the initial displacement of the axion, the initial condition, which determine how big the amplitude are when they start. So if you put everything together, you get a formula for the abundance of axion today, which matches the observed dark matter abundance if the displacement is of order one and the decay constant is of order 10 to the 12 GV, which correspond to the masses of order uh, uh, six micro electron volt. However, you see that the final abundance is not fixed just in terms of the mass of the action, the decay constant of the action, but also depends on the initial condition where you start from. So varying the initial condition, varying the places you are looking at in the big universe, it will uh, 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 match the prediction of uh, uh, dark matter today by for different value of the decay constant FA. In other words, for any uh, uh, values of the decay constant FA, different part of the universe will see different abundance of dark matter. For example, let's say that FA is of order 10 to 12 GB. This means that most of the universe We'll have theta of order one. We'll observe the right dark matter abundance we observe today. But there will still be regions in, uh, in the universe where observer will see a smaller value of the abundance or the abundance of the action with respect to the one we observe here. Let's say that FA instead is 10 to the 16 GV. Then it means that in most of the universe, they will see a much larger abundance than the one we measure here. And only small spots of the universe, the actual abundance fit the experiments today. One might be uh, induced to think that uh, this argument prefer values of FA of order 10 to the 12 GB, where basically most of the universe could explain the value of the action we observe uh, here today. However, uh, this is, might be a too rushed uh, conclusion. And in fact, it was argued uh, uh, some time ago that uh, even if, uh, for example, FA is large, so most of the universe will see too much dark matter, 
Uh, on, nevertheless, on the other hand, the fact that we all, uh, we had inflation before uh, translates into the fact that an enhanced abundance of dark matter corresponds to basically a suppressed value of uh, baryon number and stars. So which means that most of the stars are actually expected in this small, smaller spots, which means that the most observer will probably observe, will still observe the right matter abundance. So uh, basically before inferring which one is probably the most likely uh, value for the decay constant of the axon, one has to understand also what is the distribution of observers in a similar way that uh, nobody is uh, surprised that on earth that uh, uh, to live uh, on a city instead in the middle of the ocean. Uh, okay, so the main conclusion here is that basically most of the uh, axion uh, parameter uh, space can actually explain the matter. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot predict in this way the mass of the axion. There is an extra, in this scenario, there is an extra constraint that come from the isocurvature bound. The same uh, basically fluctuation that you observe in different parts of the universe during inflation produce fluctuation of the axion fields that basically translates in a small fluctuation of the dark matter abundance in the nearby patches of the universe. When these patches re-enter the horizon, they produce what are called isocurvature fluctuations. Iso there are fluctuations in the, in the dark matter which are not aligned with the diabatic mode induced by the inflaton fluctuations. This type of fluctuations are highly constrained by Planck which basically set them to be uh, quite smaller than the usual one, which are already very small. So this translates in an upper bound to this size of this fluctuation, which are uh, controlled by the Hubble parameter. So eventually this means that uh, uh, not only in this scenario, the Hubble scale must be below FA, but it must be quite below FA. So for example, for FA of order 10 to 12 GB, the Hubble scale must be below 10 to the 8 GB. So in this scenario, is, this scenario basically predicts <coughs> uh, only very small scale inflationary models. Uh, so observation of primordial uh, tensor modes will be in conflict with uh, this uh, uh, scenario. So this range of masses for the axiom. Uh, because of this bound, actually this is what actually determine the end point of uh, uh, this uh, parameter range. Indeed, the near theta equal to pi, what happens is that the isocurvature uh, becomes large and uh, they cannot be made uh, too small because the Hubble during inflation cannot be too small. For example, it cannot be eventually smaller than BBN, but actually it cannot even be smaller than the mass of the axon itself, if you want axon to be dark matter. And this basically poses the endpoints of the parameter range uh, uh, in, the, in the upper part here, near theta equal to pi. This parameter range is also interesting. Recently, it has been observed that in this uh, near theta equal to pi, actually what happens is that uh, despite the fact that the axion look constant on the scales, uh, non-linearities produce small scale structure that uh, can have important implication for axion searches because it will produce uh, clumps at smaller scales. Um, okay, so this is the first scenario. Now I can move on on the second case, which is more interesting. So in the second case, what happens is that uh, quantum fluctuation during inflation or thermal fluctuation are large enough to restore the Pechequin symmetry along the observable universe. So after inflation, no matter what was original displacement of the axion, what happens is that because of the uh, restore, restoration of the U1 symmetry, the axions start uh, acquiring all possible value between zero and two pi within the observable universe. We can think of this as like a, a phase transition uh, of the U1 phase at high temperature as the, uh, the, the temperature cools down. Uh, this means that basically uh, eventually the, the axion will uh, evolve uh, with the 
initial condition which is completely unrelated with the original value of theta. So the evolution of the axion field will not depend anymore on which patches of the universe, of the bigger universe you are focusing on. And the eventual abundance is only determined basically by the mass of the axion, not by the initial condition in theta. So in this case, the abundance is calculable. The price we pay for this calculability is that now we have to compute it. And unfortunately, it's not that easy. In fact, exactly because the axion field is not constant, gradient terms are there. So the equation of motion are now full partial differential equation, which are non-linear. And this non-linearity give rise to all of a bunch of uh, uh, a bestiary of objects, topological defects, and uh, other quasi soliton states. For example, strings, which are vortices, the analogous of vortices in superfluids, which I will uh, describe more in detail in the following slides. Domain walls, which are basically membrane-like objects which interpolate between uh, the different vacua in the QCD axion potential. Uh, oscillons, which are basically fluctuations of the field that explore the tip of the QCD potential at theta equal to pi. And uh, basically they are long-lived quasi-soliton solution which oscillates many times and eventually decay. Mini cluster, which are basically clouds of uh, gravitationally condensed uh, inhomogeneities of the axions. And uh, for example, also axion stars, which are uh, uh, soliton uh, objects which are held together by gravity. These are uh, basically uh, star-like objects uh, of a size which is comparable to the De Broglie wavelength of the axion itself. So they are astrophysical uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. All these objects may happen and will happen during the evolution of uh, the axion field and have different roles. So I will go through now uh, very briefly towards the cosmological history and see how each of these terms, when each of these terms uh, play a role. So at the very beginning, we start with the, when the temperature of the Hubble scale is very large, of order FA. In this regime, uh, strings form by keyboard mechanism. I will see more in details how they, why they form. Let's assume they form at the very early on. At this time, the mass and the axial potential is, uh, is basically relevant because the scales are too high. So the strings are the only objects you have. They evolve they, in a complicated way, emitting axion uh, waves until the mass becomes important at Hubble scale of order the mass of the axon. At this point, domain wall forms. Domain wall and strings usually collide and uh, decay, releasing just uh, uh, axions and oscillons. Oscillons also decay eventually. At the end, you have just a gas of axions until matter radiation equality when gravitational effects becomes important inhomogeneity starts to clump, forming mini clusters, at larger scale mini halos, and eventually maybe action stars until today. I will, my discussion from now on will mostly focus on the first part, because this is what actually enters in the determination of the action abundance itself. The other objects, in particular mini cluster, mini halos, and action stars are more relevant instead for the structure of dark matter today, not for their abundance, because after this first phase, basically the action become non relativistic and basically the action number is conserved. Uh, so I will mostly focus my discussion from now on, on the first stages, on the production of actions and uh, their abundance. So strings and domain walls. During this regime, the action field evolution is highly nonlinear. This nonlinear evolution basically make any analytic approach very challenging. At the same time, uh, the, the physics here produce uh, uh, a larger hierarchy of scale. It's a multi-scale problem, which at the same time make also numerical approaches very challenging. 
And this is the reason why after 40 years of research in this field, uh, no yet completely reliable estimate of the axon uh, abundance is unfortunately available. Uh, so let's, uh, so to understand better this, uh, uh, all these challenges and uh, what is happening, let's go a, li a little bit closer and see what actually happens, happening in, this, uh, in these stages of the evolution. So very early on, after just the PQ phase transition, what happens is the axon will find himself randomly distributed in space, which means that uh, axion strings will form. Axion strings are uh, objects, solitonic objects, associated to the field configuration, where the axion basically winds the fundamental domain of the PQ uh, symmetry as you go around uh, a loop in space. Since uh, action is randomly distributed, this configuration will form just by uh, statistically uh, randomness. And uh, uh, this means that somewhere inside the circle, the uh, field is still stuck on top of the unbroken phase, which means there is some energy density stored inside the circle. If you move, move smoothly the circle around, you'll see that basically this energy density is distributed over a region which looks like a string, a vortex, basically. Uh, the size of this vortex is basically fixed by the mass of the heavy mode that is associated to the restoration of the phase, which is typically of order the uh, Peche Queen scale uh, VPQ. The main, uh, basically, uh, uh, characteristics, property of this configuration is the energy associated to it, the tension, which is the energy per unit length. This energy per unit length is basically fixed by the PQ scale, which is the energy stored inside the core. But there is a large contribution from the gradient, the axion gradient around it. This uh, contribution is logarithmically diverged in the IR. And uh, it's basically this logarithmic divergence is uh, the analog of the logarithmic divergence of the electric field you have on a electric uh, charge electric wire. So this logarithmic divergence is eventually cut off in the infrared by the presence of other strings, which in a cosmological context are of order, uh, are at the distance of order Hubble. So eventually this object here is of order basically V P Q square log of the UV scale FA UMR over Hubble. Uh, uh, Together with these strings, there will be uh, oscillation of the axion field, basically axion waves, long wave axion coupled to this string with a, a effective coupling goes like one over the log, just because the long wave, wavelength mode basically see a renormalized tension with uh, this log. In, again, in cosmological context, the relevant scale of these wavelengths are over the Hubble, which means, in, and since Hubble depends on time, both the tension of the strings and the fatigue coupling of IR axion waves to the axion to strings scale with time, they slide with, logarithmically with this log of MRT. Okay, this is an important feature that will become relevant later. Okay, let's see what happens to these uh, strings after they form. So let's imagine first that we neglect the interaction between the strings. These strings are free. So they basically do not interact. They just stay there. They're not relativistic objects that uh, lay down in, com in conformal co coordinates that just don't move. As the universe, exp so the energy, the full energy associated with this configuration is basically related to the number of strings per Hubble volume times their tension. So this parameter side basically parameterizes how many strings per Hubble volume you have. As the universe expands, the horizon grows, so more string will re-enter the horizon. The number of strings per Hubble patch will grow. At a certain point, oh, as the universe expands, more and more string will re-enter the horizon. Until a certain point, the density of string is large enough that uh, the string can start interacting. The interaction makes them uh, uh, recombine, form loops that shrink and emit action. So the, the, the string network releases energy through action 
And in this way, it reduces the effective number of strings per Hubble patch. So there are two competing effects. The Hubble expansion, which increases the number of strings, and this interconnection, which basically this uh, interaction, which decreases. So the system is drawn towards uh, a quasi-equilibrium point, uh, as in other example of self-organized criticality. Uh, this system, therefore, the system evolves in what is called a scaling solution, a, a system of criticality, which uh, indeed uh, uh, shows uh, properties of uh, uh, scaling variant properties. This system has been uh, studied uh, at length in the past and uh, in, the, in the more recently, thanks to uh, it was being confirmed by actual uh, computer simulations. So I'll show you a, a, a result of a computer simulation, which basically uh, shows this evolution explicitly. I hope. Oh. And I lost again. Maybe it's the simulation, Giovanni. I think you should <laughs> keep it. Yeah. So if I mean, uh, but it's funny because I ran many times without Zoom and it was working. Maybe the Zoom plus the animation creates problem. All right. Uh -huh. I mean, if, if it is not important, I mean, if it is not no, no, crucial, I, I, can, I, 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 would, I would skip it. Yes, go directly to. Can you can you see this? Oh, no, the share screen is to interrupt. OK. Uh, uh, the evolution continues until the Hubble scale is awarded the mass of the axiom. At this point, domain wall form. So the, Domain walls are the, the configuration basically, which are membrane like uh, configuration, which is uh, the region of space where the axion finds itself at the tip of the QCD axion, uh, QCD potential at theta equal to pi. So there will be some energy density stored in this uh, region of space, which look like a membrane, a domain wall. The domain wall is thick of order, thickness of order, uh, the inverse size of the mass of the axion. And uh, at least in the case n equal one, where the, basically the, uh, this domain wall are topologically trivial, what they do is to pull a, uh, together the strings, which shrink. There is no conserved number for this uh, configuration, which eventually shrink in a, a cloud in a gas of axions. So in principle, just counting the final number of axions could in principle give you the, the result you're looking for, the uh, total abundance of action produced by this object. Uh, and in fact, uh, recently, uh, several uh, collaboration actually uh, tried to uh, compute by brute force simulations, the full evolution from the onset of the string configuration until uh, the formation of uh, domain walls and their decay. Uh, this simulation led to results which are compatible with an abundance, which is of order the misalignment, uh, mis misalignment mechanism abundance when you average over, over, over all possible values of theta from zero to, 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 to pi, which basically point to a mass of the axion, which is of order 26 micron electron volts or so. However, we have uh, to and notice the following. These simulations uh, actually can only simulate a hierarchy of scales, the, the ratio between the thickness of the domain walls and the strings, which is set by the ratio of FA over MA, which is of order the, the, the size of the simulation, the grids, which is of order 10 to the three, versus a, a physical size in the actual universe, which is uh, almost 30 orders of magnitude bigger, 10 to the third. 
This will not be a huge issue if during the scaling regime, during the buildup of this larger hierarchy, uh, all the properties of uh, the network of the strings of the evolution stay the same. After all, uh, we saw that there is some sort of attractor in the evolution and uh, we expect basically the physics to be invariant along all this evolution. However, I will uh, argue that uh, this is most probably not the case and there are large deviations uh, that uh, uh, can affect the final result. Uh, so, uh, so we propose a different approach the approach is the following. You simulate only the part of the evolution you can actually trust, which is uh, where the hierarchy of scale are not large enough, but they're large enough to actually see the scaling regime and to measure the properties of this uh, uh, regime. Then thanks to the fact that uh, the, there are no new scales appearing in the problem, you can extrapolate uh, uh, using the attractor solution until at least until the, the point where new physics uh, appears, which means new dynamics appear due to the uh, onset of the mass of the axion. At this point, of course, we don't know what happens reliably, but in the meantime, a large uh, uh, portion of the energy of the network has been released in axion uh, radiation. So we can actually at least estimate the abundance of this action uh, emission during this uh, scaling regime, which is more reliable. And this will lead to a lower bound on the final abundance of action. If this uh, emission is the most important one, then this will also give uh, a, an estimate of the final abundance, otherwise it will just give a lower bound. So this is, so basically to study this uh, uh, evolution, we basically uh, perform uh, uh, simulations. So this is, for example, a simulation shows how by different initial condition, the, the network evolves towards an attractor towards a common value of, of string sparable patches. However, as I argued before, the, the properties of the network, the, the evolution of the strings depend logarithmically on uh, uh, time on the, on the scale. And indeed the number of strings sparable patch uh, of the attractor of the, of the uh, basically, yeah, the attractor of the evolution seems not to be constant, but to evolve with time. So the various initial conditions, the various, uh, various simulations converge towards a common volume, uh, value, which however grows. This uh, violation of scale in this uh, growth of the uh, attractor properties actually been confirmed by many other uh, collaboration studying the same thing. If you focus on the initial condition which reach uh, the scaling regime at the earliest and increasing the statistics, you actually see that uh, the, this violation of scaling, this growth of the uh, critical value of string sparable patches actually grows, seems to grow uh, linearly with the log, which means that despite the fact the string uh, uh, simulation uh, actually see all, only order one strings per double patches. If you extrapolate uh, to the physical regime of the log of order 60, 70, you'll find that uh, if uh, this growth is uh, continue uh, like uh, it seems it does here, it will reach uh, an order of magnitude the larger number of strings. Uh, this is so uh, one uh, important effect, but it's not the critical one. The most important and most dramatic effects is actually uh, the evolution during the scaling regime of the spectrum of action emitted by the strings themselves. So here you see a plot of uh, the, uh, 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 the spectrum of action emitted. On the x-axis, uh, actually, you see is uh, uh, the momentum of the action emitted normalized to Hubble for various values of the log, which means for various uh, times. So 5.5 is earlier and then 7.5 is later. And you see that uh, while at the very beginning, the spectrum is highly peaked towards UV modes, uh, as the, the evolution, uh, uh, as the, the simulation evolves, as the, 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 the networks evolve, it seems that the spectrum becomes flatter and flatter, in particular that IR mode become more and more important. 
And on the right hand side, you see a plot where basically uh, it uh, I statistic simulation has measured this spectral index, this slope very accurately as a function of time. And you see that also this quantity grows linearly with the log. Now, the important thing is to realize that all simulation can be performed today uh, are such that the spectral index is less than one, which means that the spectrum is dominated on the UV, which means that most of the energy released by the strings goes in a very few, very energetic axions, very uh, UV uh, with a UV spectrum. If instead the spectrum is IR dominated, the same energy is relieved in a large number of soft action. And since at the end of the day, the abundance is uh, determined by the number density of action, is the number that counts, uh, depending if the spectrum is IR or UV dominated, the final abundance uh, prediction is completely different. Uh, and uh, here you see uh, what, uh, uh, how different it can be. This is a, a plot of basically how the number of action released by strings normalized to the misalignment prediction changes with the log. Uh, if we assume that the spectral index continues to grow linearly as we see in the simulation. So in the region that can be simulated, the orange uh, uh, square, uh, the number of action is basically uh, dominated by the misalignment mechanism because the contribution from strings is highly suppressed because you have a UV spectrum. But if the spectrum become a yard, let's say a log above 10, then the contribution from the strings start to dominate and become much, much bigger than the misalignment one. This means that even if you simulate at very small logs and you will not see any log appreciable log dependence. So any extrapolations uh, from uh, this simulation do not take into account this evolution of the spectrum will lead to values of the final abundance, which is much smaller than what it could become if the spectrum indeed evolves towards IR dominated spectrum, Q larger than one, as it seems it does. So the larger hierarchy is basically determined by the fact that the energy contained in the string uh, network is enhanced both by the fact that the tension itself mu grows with the log and the fact that the number of strings per apple patches grows with the log. So this psi log uh, parameter can reach easily reach of order thousand increasing by three, maybe four orders of magnitude total energy containing axions if the release spectrum is IR dominated. So the larger uh, discrepancy between the two determinations is basically determined by this different assumption. Uh, now, the final uh, announcement is actually not as big as you might uh, infer from this uh, Xilog uh, uh, parameter here, because the abundance of action produced in this way is so large, the nonlinearities become important. And there's a nice effect uh, that uh, one can see from uh, a, a very simple argument. So the energy density basically received two contributions, one from the gradient energy and one from the potential. However, we just saw that the energy density is much bigger than the misalignment contribution at M over the H by this 10 to the three enhancement. This means that most of the energy is containing gradient energy because the potential energy is bounded by M squared F squared. Uh, this means that the Hamiltonian will stay quadratic even at uh, scales of MAO equal to H, which means it will, start, it will continue to evolve as if there is no mass even after the uh, mass turn, turns on. So this evolution continues until uh, basically the, uh, the mass will continue to grow, the, this part will continue to reshift. So uh, this evolution will continue until uh, the two terms become comparable. In the meantime, the mass had grown, and this growth of mass basically dump a little bit. There will be abundance of action that you will infer otherwise. Uh, I'm afraid that now I have another simulation. Okay, no. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the actual simulation that you can perform uh, numerically 
actually fit very well with this uh, analytic understanding. Here you see that the dots are result of actual simulations and the continuous lines uh, curves are actually the inferred behavior uh, by the argument I gave before, opportunately corrected with all the reshift factors and so on, and the shape of the spectrum. So eventually the uh, abundance is therefore, uh, if you inject the expected value of Xi log of this enhancement of 10 to the three, it will be an enhancement with respect to the misalignment mechanism of order 10 to the two. And basically this uh, determine uh, this parameter space in the, in the, in the axion uh, plot. Uh, the mass of the, the, this gives basically a lower bound to the, uh, to the axiom produced by strings. And in this uh, post inflationary scenario, which is of order uh, half a milli electron volt or so, which is more than an order of magnitude larger than what you would have inferred naively by just averaging over theta the misalignment mechanism uh, without the contribution from strings. Uh, the, probably the most interesting uh, uh, feature of this result is that uh, the predictions for in the two scenarios are almost completely uh, complementary. This means that uh, most of the, if not all the parameter space allowed by experiment uh, can actually still uh, allow for the axion solution to the dark matter problem. And uh, uh, depending on the value of the mass of the action, we might be able to actually discriminate between uh, pre-inflationary scenario, post-inflationary scenario, and actually uh, uh, infer something about uh, the early evolution of our universe much before, uh, much before BBN. Of course, uh, this uh, uh, shifted uh, uh, prediction have important implication for experiments because of course now the uh, experiments that are most sensitive to this post inflationary scenario uh, are shifted uh, uh, are shifted so this the uh, experiments uh, uh, like most of the experiments based on cavities seems to be uh, if this uh, extrapolation is correct seems to be uh, only sensitive to one of the scenarios, the pre-inflationary scenario, while the other scenario uh, requires uh, larger masses of the action, so a smaller experiment which are sensitive to uh, a smaller Compton wave and to the Broglie wave. Uh, all right, so I will uh, then wrap up here. Uh, it took a little bit more time. Uh, so my conclusions, so the QCD action is uh, probably one of the most compelling candidates for dark matter today. There have been uh, a lot of recent efforts towards the determination of the axion abundance uh, in the case of this dark matter. Uh, I think a deeper understanding of the evolution of the axion field in the early universe has been achieved with the, these large scale simulations. Uh, and uh, we are slowly moving towards a more reliable estimate of the axion abundance. Still, uh, there is a lot to do uh, most of the conclusion I draw uh, rely on uh, uh, some extrapolations of the simulation we did and uh, require some confirmation. In particular, it would be nice to finally reach the uh, regime where you can actually see that the spectrum turns uh, IR dominated. This will finally confirm the large uh, production of uh, action from uh, strings and will make uh, the lower bound we propose more solid, or it might even rule out this, uh, this uh, uh, scenario. Uh, the, and uh, further, there will be, of course, also still there are a lot to do to determine reliably the contribution from domain walls. If indeed uh, the evolution seems to change completely the dynamics, what happens on, uh, when n is larger than one is still, uh, a, I think, an open issue. There have been uh, recent uh, also discussion on uh, extra effect connected with uh, the superconductivity of strings. I will not have time to discuss this further. And, uh, uh, and of course, all this discussion is uh, crucial to basically determine what are the right initial condition for the future evolution of the action field and the formation of mini clusters and other objects that are 
uh, very important for uh, experiments because they can completely change uh, the actual signals that uh, they can be received, at least in holoscope searches for axion. And with this, I conclude. <laughs>when the temperature of order QCD scale. So much before you can actually see the strings in the CMB or uh, cosmo uh, cosmologically large scales. So I don't know whether Esteban is uh, satisfied. I cannot unmute, sorry. I can do it. Yeah, please. Uh, but I have to find him. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, it's not. Yes, I think now. It's Mr. okay. You, you, you can speak now. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm satisfied. Okay. Just, okay. Just a curiosity question. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next question so from uh, Lorenzo Maccone. I think you can even uh, speak uh, by yourself, but let me read it. In the meantime, uh, Stefania can, uh, can let him speak. Okay, Maccone. So I don't understand your claim that n much bigger than one implies that the axiom field is in a classical state. Which classical state, a coherent state, a thermal state, there are many quantum states with, with uh, n much larger than one. For example, a Bose-Einstein condensate you were mentioning at, this, at some point. Uh, well, this, uh, uh, it doesn't matter. When n is much larger than one, uh, a large occupation number is basically the limit we usually call a, a, a system to, be, to behave as classical. So it behaves like a classical equation motion just because the occupation angle is large, so any quantum effects which is related to the commutator, which is non-zero, is suppressed by, by the large N. Uh, sorry, I don't understand this claim because that's clearly not true. For example, a Schrodinger cat is, has N much larger than one. It's a cat, but it's certainly not classical. So maybe I'm missing what you mean by classical. Well, but uh, you know that even the in the case of the... <laughs> The, the, the Schrodinger cat, the system they cohere very fast, so the evolution is classical. Sure, sure, but you have to have a mechanism for decoherence. Right? Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. Which one it would be in this case? Well, the, the, the system has non trivial interactions. So, okay, so, so you mean the interaction with the rest of the universe makes it decohere? Yeah, the rest of the universe itself, it, it, even a radiation of other actors you don't see is enough. Even black body radiation is enough. No? Okay, so, so the quantum state would be a thermal state then. That's uh, what you're saying. Uh, uh, the, this classical state you're talking about would be a thermal state. Um, I don't know about, I, I'm not sure about uh, that you can associate temperature. I'm not saying that this in, in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so so the, there are basically two classical states, the thermal state or a coherent state. One is mixed, the other one is pure. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you. Okay, there is another question by Valerie Rubakov. So I think Valerie, why don't you 
try. Okay, um, please. I have a simple question, which I got lost at some point. You show that uh, if you include more uh, logarithmic effects, then uh, you will get increasing the number of produced axions as compared to uh, the previous calculations. Then I would expect that the mass of the axions should be smaller, not larger than uh, in the previous calculations. Why is it, why is it larger? Why does it move to the right in your plot? Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, here, right? Yes. You're referring to this. Yes, uh, referring to this and the, to the upper, upper plot, upper left plot. Yes. Yeah, the upper left plot shows you that the number of axions is large compared to misalignment. So their mass must be smaller. Uh, no, it's the other way around. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, so you, you get more axions. So by you have to compensate for this more axion. So you increase the mass of the axion and increasing the mass of the axion, you make less dark matter. So even in the usual misalignment mechanism, maybe I show you the other the formula you are more uh, familiar with here. You see the, the amount of dark matter in this formula it's proportional, it grows with the phase. So it's inversely, inversely proportional to the mass. So increasing the mass, you suppress the abundance. And this is the case because the initial abundance, is, the initial energy density is basically fed by lambda QCD. The mass determines when this uh, energy density starts to redshift. The larger the mass, the earlier it starts to reshift, and the, the smaller it will be today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if battery is uh, satisfied, yeah. There is another question by Arne Wickenbrock. So maybe you can speak yourself, otherwise I can, I can read it. So Stefania, can you unmute? Uh, I'm unmuted, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, Giovanni, super nice talk. I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, everything that you derived was uh, valid for the QCD axiom. And I'm wondering whether there are similar uh, like considerations that one can do for axiom like particles that ex could explain dark matter. Yeah, uh, most of the discussion I made, uh, it could be easily translated to uh, an ALP. In the case, you restore the phase after uh, inflation. In that case, you also produce the strings. Then uh, depending on the scale of inflation, we start uh, the, the Hubble scale with respect to the mass, it will start to oscillate later. Indeed, uh, it was recently uh, discuss the case, for example, where you have uh, masses of these halves, which are very, very small, so that uh, the, the domain wall will form a very late, maybe they don't even form because if the mass of the ax uh, this axion are uh, even sub uh, able today, they will not form. Still, you'll have these uh, strings around and they can lead to interesting effect, uh, for example, uh, in the polarization of the CMB. So yes, so uh, the answer is uh, you can translate uh, all what uh, we did for the QCD action also for uh, ALPS and of course uh, the, there will be similar results also there. Maybe even more, uh, even more po possibilities are there because of course you have an extra parameter and you can play with that and have uh, uh, other effects that are not present for the QCD action. 
Okay. Any other question? Well, I have a very naive one. So, so I, I, as far as I understand, you, you, you do your simulations for up to logs of order eight. Do I understand correctly? Yes. But you need to extrapolate up to 65, right? Yes. So did you try to estimate the, the uncertainty, the error coming from this? Uh... Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, it depends which quantity, of course. Um, right. Uh, for example, let's see. Here, here, you see the precision is pretty high because the statistics uh, errors are very low and it matches very accurately uh, a, a linear uh, extrapolation. So these lines you see are, for example, extrapolation with a linear, linear plus quadratic. And uh, of course, if you extrapolate for a long log, they will start to diverge. So this 15 can become 30 or 40 and can become like, I don't know, seven or, or so. So it, of course the uncertainty will be large. Uh, uh, and similar, even more so for the extrapolation of the spectral index here. In principle, here you see that, uh, okay, we, we, if you extrapolate this, this is our two, uh, extrapolation. One is linear and one is quadratic. The quadratic is, of course, a bigger error. If you extrapolate this to log uh, 70, of course, this band will become huge. Still, they will be above one. So the actual values of the spectral index that we get when we extrapolate to log equals to 70 have larger uncertainty. It can be like two, it can be like 10. Nevertheless, it's larger than one. And uh, uh, you can convince yourself that the moment is uh, larger than one, like 1 1.1 or 1 1.2 or three or four, the final result will not depend much on the value of Q. Once the spectrum is picked in the IR, most of these axioms uh, will have uh, of order Hubble, uh, uh, will be produced uh, in a large quantity and it doesn't matter what is the tail of the distribution which has less energy. So the main uh, uh, question here is whether this Q become larger than one and will stay larger than one at large logs. Uh, we don't see any sign of uh, flattening. We are very close to one. The hope is that the next generation uh, simulation will allow to overshoot this uh, threshold and uh, see that indeed uh, the different behavior is reached. This di different behavior is actually crucial to trust all the simulations because if you have a spectrum that is UV dominated, then all your prediction will be dominated by physics you don't know. Physics are the scale of the pitch equation. Instead, if the spectrum is IR dominated, then you complete the couple from the UV physics and you can really rely uh, on, uh, on your uh, uh, determination. So this is a, a very important uh, point. We hope that maybe the next, of course, this is a logarithmic plot. So you need uh, to increase your uh, uh, computer power. The, the size of the, the simulation must grow by a factor of three or four. But of course, the simulation is cube to the four. So you need some orders of mind to the increase in computer power. I hope in the next five, 10 years, maybe it will be reached and that we can get a definite answer to this whole question. Okay, thanks a lot. So it's getting late, but maybe the last two questions <laughs> very quickly. One from Pablo Kile. Thanks for the nice talk. Could you comment a bit on the possible consequences of these strings being superconducting? <laughs> uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, uh, my, uh, I don't know because I, I didn't study very carefully. Uh, there are uh, uh, contrasting claims in the literature whether these effects are uh, important. It seems that there is consensus that this if, uh, the strings being superconducting do not interfere too much with the abundance of axion unless there is a primordial magnetic field. 
And even in the presence of the opinion of the magnetic field, there are contrasting uh, uh, claims about the effects. So uh, uh, my feeling is that uh, at least for the question that is relevant here about the abundance, the fact that the strings are superconducting, at least naively I would expect to not be so relevant, but uh, the reliable answer is, uh, uh, I don't know. Pablo, are you satisfied? Yes, yes, thanks. Okay, there's a final question from Ricardo Rattazzi. So maybe I see that Ricardo is unmuted. So maybe, Ricardo, why don't you speak yourself? Oh, it's a very simple question. Uh, so in your simulation, you assume that the radial mode is of order FA. Am I right or am I wrong? Uh, you are right. So if you were to take it way, way, way smaller, then this- Sorry, sorry, I, I take it back. I take it back. Uh -huh. The simulation does not depend on FA. The dependence on the- FA No, no I'm talking about the M M MR. I'm, talking, I'm worrying about oh, the- Oh, yeah, yeah, let me, let me, let me, yeah, let me finish. So the simulation does not depend on FA. So the dependence on FA is just the rescaling of the full abundance, of the full energy density. So it only depends on the radial mode. Yeah, so I did. Yeah, yeah. So, my, the, exactly. so the plots you saw are indeed plots in log of MR over H star. So you can choose whatever MR you want, any quartic you want, right? You plug it in, it will give a, a log. So if you go down to MR of order weak scale. Uh, yes, but uh, uh, to weak scale, the log is still of order 30 or so. 30. Okay, thank you. So the minimum it can be is of order 23. Yeah, when yeah. MR is small, that you start getting astrophysical constraint also on the radial mode because it's light that it can be produced in stars. Okay. So at, at least until 23, you have to extrapolate. Okay. So I think it's time to <laughs> thank Giovanni for his uh, very nice talk. I, I recall you that the slides and the video will be posted online. So, and then there is a Q and A uh, session. So if you have any other question, you can uh, ask Giovanni there. So thank you, Giovanni again. And uh, thank you everybody for participating. And uh, well, the next uh, GGI tea break will be on next uh, Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank bye. you. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Joanne. Bye -bye. Beautiful. Bellissimo.